UAB MedCast is an ongoing medical education podcast. The UAB Division of Continuing Education designates that each episode of this enduring material is worth a maximum of 0.25 AMA PRA Category 1 credit. To collect credit, please visit uabmedicine.org slash medcast and complete the episode's post-test. Welcome to UAB MedCast, a continuing education podcast for medical professionals. Bringing knowledge to your world. Here's Melanie Cole. Among patients with refractory hypertension, there are those whose blood pressure remains uncontrolled in spite of maximal medical therapy. This is a common clinical problem faced by both primary care clinicians and specialists. My guest today is Dr. Suzanne Operell. She is the Director of Vascular Biology and Hypertension Program at UAB Medicine. Welcome to the show, Dr. Operell. So please define refractory hypertension and what the difference is between resistant and refractory. The term refractory hypertension was defined by my colleague, Dr. David Calhoun here at UAB, as hypertension that cannot be controlled on five antihypertensive drugs or more. And those five drugs should include a thiazide-type diuretic and an aldosterone receptor antagonist or mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, such as spironolactone or plerinone. Resistant hypertension is a little bit, has a larger patient population and is a little bit less severe. It means that you uh, are uncontrolled on three antihypertensive drugs, one of which should be a diuretic, and they should be used at at maximally recommended doses or maximally tolerated doses. So what are some patient characteristics for refractory hypertension? Oh, very typically, these people are older. You don't usually, when the blood pressure first pops up as elevated, it's usually fairly easy to treat, tend to be older, and they may have comorbidities like diabetes or atherosclerotic vascular disease. Frequently, they're obese, and frequently they have obstructive sleep apnea, which, of course, causes sleep disturbance, and sleep disturbance causes stress. And we think that stress is probably involved in the pathogenesis of refractory hypertension. Although we're studying, we don't really know what the etiologies are yet. So if somebody is diagnosed, what would set the precedent? What would be the prognosis? And what would you do next if they they hit that plateau? Um, The the prognosis is that there would... um, be at high risk of developing cardiovascular disease, especially heart failure now. Heart failure is the bugaboo of the uncontrolled hypertensive, but also uh, they might be prone to stroke and heart attack too. So we would be concerned about those things, and we would first try to evaluate them for secondary causes of hypertension, that is, things that could be cured. For example, uh, aldosterone excess, which is usually due to an adrenal adenoma, or catecholamine excess due to a pheochromocytoma, a chromosome tumor, or um, in some cases, uh, renal artery stenosis. So back to some causes for just a minute, Dr. Operal. Are there some secondary causes of refractory hypertension and possible pharmacologic causes as well? Uh, Unfortunately, some of the causes of refractory hypertension are that the patient in fact, does not take the medicine that is prescribed, either because of intolerances or just disliking medications. So it's very important to make sure that the patient uh, is ad- is taking the medicine that's prescribed. There are a few ways to do that. You can uh, have the patient bring the meds to clinic and then have him or her take them in the clinic and then follow their blood pressure a few hours and see that, that they respond to the therapy. Or um, there are special laboratories that can measure blood pressure medicines and their metabolites in the urine. So you can you can check that way. But th- there are relatively few labs that do that. Also, talking frankly to the patient and extracting the true truth from the patient always helps. How often would you think that it's necessary to do the assessment of adherence? I would. We always do some sort of assessment of adherence if we really can't get the, the patient's blood pressure uh, under control with some of our favorite drugs. Uh, there, there are some agents that work better than others. And if the patient really doesn't respond to three or four or five of them, uh, we really need to dig deeper. 
And so speak about some of the non-pharmacological recommendations for refractory hypertension. Well, always, whether you're refractory or just an ordinary hypertensive, we recommend uh, increasing physical activity and losing weight. Uh, Here in Alabama, where our practice is, most patients, in fact, most of the patients that we see in referral are obese. So we try to encourage them to lose weight by modifying their diet, which includes a healthy diet, not just restricting salt. Um, and uh, increasing physical activity. If, as the blood flows past the endothelium, nitric oxide is released and blood pressure falls. So increased, and also increasing physical activity helps with weight loss. So it's weight loss, physical activity, improving the diet um, are helpful if patients will really do it. And if the patient is very obese, gastric bypass surgery is, should be considered. So speak about continued treatment of refractory hypertension as the patient gets older, then what are you looking for as far as secondary causes or reasons to keep them on those medications or change them around? Most of the patients that we see with refractory hypertension have had it for a long time, 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And it things, almost everything gets worse as one gets older. And with respect to blood pressure, uh, the... uh, Endothelium gets worn out, so you get less nitric oxide, less of a depressor influence from that. Also, uh, there is replacement of uh, smooth muscle cells with fibroblasts, which produce connective tissue. So you get collagen instead of elastin. And as we get wrinkles on our face, we get stiff blood vessels, which makes the systolic blood pressure go up further when the heart beats. And we know that it's the systolic blood pressure, not the diastolic, that correlates with cardiovascular disease outcomes and death uh, in people over age 50. So that's what we're looking for, the systolic blood pressure, and we're using every means possible to get it down and prevent it from increasing further. Are there some novel device therapies that you might use? There there are novel device therapies, but they have been, um, they're experimental still uh, because um, the most commonly used of them, which is uh, transcatheter renal denervation, the removal of the renal nerves, uh, failed in a randomized control trial called Simplicity Hypertension 3. This was the first trial that really had a sham control so that the the patient went to the cath lab. This was done by interventional cardiologists, had the renal angiogram, and then was randomized to either denervation by radiofrequency ablation of the nerves. Or if you were randomized to the control group, you had a sham procedure. So you were already uh, in the cath lab lying there um, having had the angiogram, and you're, you have on um, uh, face mask goggles, so you can't see anything, and there's nice music in your ears, and you're sedated. And the operator is supposed to stand there for 20 minutes, as he or she would do if there were active denervation, so that the participants didn't know whether they had denervation or not, and the person who was following them in the clinic didn't know either. It was blinded. And lo and behold, six months later, the sham group did almost as well as the denervation group, so that that procedure has flopped. There are better procedures with better catheters, better better study designs, and better trained uh, operators uh, to try to get a, result, get a better result, but we really don't know about the future of renal denervation. There are also procedures to um, take advantage of the baroreceptor to lower blood pressure. There are a variety of other things that AV fistula uh, procedure that goes femoral artery to femoral vein. There's a uh, procedure that stretches the carotid artery so that the artery se- thinks uh, that the blood pressure is elevated and it shuts down sympathetic outflow. So there are a lot of things going on experimentally. Uh, none of them has been approved for use in the United States yet. Although renal radiofrequency, transcatheter renal denervation is approved in places like Australia and Germany, and it's kind of popular over there. But experts vary in their opinions of how good the procedure is and how well um, 
how long the benefit will last if there is a benefit. There are two major problems. One, there's no way to tell whether you've completely denervated the kidney. And two, there's no easy way to tell whether the nerves grow back. And those are the two big questions that have not been um, well answered by preclinical studies in animal models. And Dr. Opal, wrap it up for us with your best advice for other physicians on how you would like them to maximize adherence and counsel lifestyle behavioral changes in their patients with refractory hypertension. I think that uh, it's very important to get the patient's attention, um, make them realize that this is a lifelong problem. Nobody is going to be able to cure this problem. Uh, They're going to have to work uh, with you or with someone in your office, frequently a, a non-physician provider or a pharmacist can be very helpful in assuring that the proper medication combinations are identified and then that there's attention to making sure that the patient takes the medicine as prescribed uh, and also that the patient makes attempts to improve lifestyle, which will uh, add on to the effects of the medicines and may actually require, decrease the medication requirement. That's the reward that the patient gets who can lose 50 pounds and walk 15,000 steps a day. He may have to take one or two fewer drugs, even if he has resistant resistant or refractory hypertension. And tell us about your team. Why is UAB so great to work with? To give myself a little bit of credit, I've been involved in hypertension research and the pathogenesis in cell preparations, animal models, and then um, small studies in people and clinical trials in people ever since um, late 1960s when I I started out uh, my research in Boston. And this has, um, as the field has evolved, um, extended to training a bunch of people. So I have a, a senior associate, Dr. David Calhoun, and we who actually coined the term Uh, refractory hypertension. And we have many trainees, many associates, many collaborators in cardiology, we sit, but also in nephrology. We have a very large nephrology division with extensive expertise in hypertension. And we have actually trained some of the nephrology fellows to do hypertension work. Also have collaborators in endocrinology and the School of Public Health and Epidemiology. So I think we have a pretty well-rounded group of docs that can deal not only with the blood pressure per se, but with its complications, which are cardiac, brain, and kidney. And a community physician can refer a patient to UAB Medicine using the MIST line at 1-800-UAB-MIST. That's 1-800-822-6478. You're listening to UAB MedCast. For more information on resources available at UAB Medicine, you can go to uabmedicine.org slash physician. That's uabmedicine.org slash physician. This is Melanie Cole. Thanks so much for listening.